So it's my pleasure to uh, launch the first of the uh, Global Health Compound Design webinars uh, for a short season uh, designed to support you all through the, the COVID crisis. Uh, and this is an extra special one because uh, this is the launch of the malaria inhibitor prediction platform. And these are models for predicting blood stage malaria activity that have been developed uh, in collaboration as a collaboration between uh, MMV, the Medicines for Malaria Venture, and uh, the EBI. Um, and our two speakers today are James Duffy, who is uh, Director of Drug Discovery at MMV, uh, and Nicola Bosk from uh, the EBI, who's a, he's a data mining and analysis scientist. Uh, I'm Caroline Lowe, and I'll be hosting the meeting uh, with my colleague, Mark Gardner. Um, the meeting, you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, please type your questions into the Q&A box, uh, and we will ask them or uh, unmute you, depending on how many people there are and how many questions there are. But uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, the two speakers today uh, are doing a two-handed affair. They, uh, James Duffy will describe the background to the project uh, and, the, and uh, tell you all about uh, the, the problem that, was, that they were trying to solve. And Nicola will tell you all about the, the new uh, web pages which are now av available for people to use. Um, James is currently Director of Drug Discovery at MMV. He moved there in 2015 uh, from Biofocus in Cambridge in the UK. And his background is in bioorganic chemistry. He holds a DPhil from the University of Sussex. Nicola is a data mining and an analysis scientist working in Andrew Leach's team. Um, he holds a PhD from ICOA in Orléans uh, and did a postdoc at the Institut Pasteur developing protein-protein interacting uh, protein-protein inhibitors using data analysis, descriptor selection and QSAR. Um, I just have a quick slide to introduce a couple more uh, webinars which are upcoming in this series. Uh, we'll try and do these meetings uh, every Thursday at the same time. If you want to know what's coming up, I suggest please look on the uh, MMV website where you will find a description of what's going on uh, and uh, links to Zoom if you haven't already uh, received an email. If you'd like to sign up for the mailing list, there is a link on the MMV website where you can do that as well. And now I will hand over to uh, James to start proceedings. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the invitation to speak at this uh, this meeting, this webinar. And it's it's, it's really uh, quite exciting. I mean, originally it started oh, over five years ago, um, and Nicholas will give a little bit of the background to the project. Uh, I'll try and explain why why we did it and why <laughs> maybe not why it's taken so long, but why, why we, where we stuck at it and why we think it's actually a really valuable tool for the uh, malaria drug discovery community and you know potentially you know applicable to other. Uh, Just neglected tropical diseases. So we're preaching to the converted here, the human impact of malaria, whether it's in uh, uh, the actual impact on human lives, the actual impact on economies is immense. And as we all well know, this disproportionately affects the most vulnerable of populations, such as pregnant women and children. And there is still an incredibly pressing need a new anti-malarial medicines and new anti-malarial drugs and actually contributing and actually uh, accelerating the, the pathway by starting uh, with compounds with predicted anti-malarial activity. So, Oh, 
although it's a perspective, and what, we, what I've shown on this graph here that we've taken from a presentation given at a Gordon uh, Research Conference um, last year, is really the sort of the hypothetical predictions of what will happen in, in, in the case of uh, malaria in really three, three scenarios. And, and as you'll see, the one scenario, or a scenario that the author didn't consider was um, a, a global pandemic and another disease. Um, but what we're looking at here uh, is the top line is where uh, if, if we don't come up with any new anti-malarial drugs and what will happen when drug resistance to the current frontline anti-malarial medicines is encountered more uh, in Asia and when it, when it goes global. And we will see an increase in the cases of malaria from where we are today, which is approximately 200 million cases and about 400,000 deaths. You know, the current trend is, is slow and, you know, still by the middle of the middle of this century, we will still be expected to have uh, certainly tens of thousands of thousands of cases. Um, but what the author was uh, was proposing and the, and the sort of the, the global health community is endorsing is, is to uh, accelerate this, um, whether this is by uh, new finance, whether it's by new, new uh, case management, use of the available tools, but it's also really about how can we, how can we most effectively uh, developed new uh, will play uh, a major part in this, but really this tool is focused around developing new anti-malarial medicines. And how can we do this? And how can we do this most effectively, uh, knowing full well that we operate in a resource-constrained environment in terms of the funding that we have available to develop these, these medicines? Um, from an MMV perspective, um, we as an organisation, as many other organisations are at the moment, philosophy of, of open innovation. And what we really mean by this is, uh, is, is sharing the data, is making sure that, uh, that the researchers have access to the data and the materials, um, doing this through collaboration with project partners, and really almost making this an open source tool. And this is a prime example of, of, of something that we've done with this, that this, this model um, was developed in partnership with, with um, uh, data providers from GSK, from AstraZeneca, from Novartis, from St. Jude's and other institutions. Um, the platform, as you'll see, is, is, is an open platform. It's been kindly hosted by our, our friends at EBI. So, and, and this kind of really fits nicely into this idea that that contributing to to um, tackling malaria really should be for as many people as possible, not a not a closed shop. And hopefully, this this tool gives the opportunity for for uh, scientists who perhaps don't actually work within malaria um, and and don't have access to sort of large databases of anti-malarial compounds to actually um, relatively simply or very simply uh, check to see whether their compounds, their, their compound structures, and they may be real compound structures, they may be virtual compound structures, have um, a potential to be, have anti-malarial activity. So where did all this, all this, all this, um, this project really come from? So since about 2010, um, uh, MMV and a number of other uh, partners have been carrying out large um, high throughput screening exercises. This really came about from the, um, the development of cost-effective phenotypic uh, wholesale uh, asexual blood stage parasite assays. Uh, we drove, the, you know, through, through advances in screening technology, we were able to drive the price down. So rather than it being sort of tens and hundreds of compounds that could be tested, it was millions. And certainly those organizations um, which had large compound libraries um, many of them were willing to open these compound libraries and screen against this, uh, against the parasite and look for anti-malarial anti activity. And, you know, at the last sort of approximate calculation, about 8 million compounds have actually been screened against the asexual blood stage of the parasite, which represents an enormous screening effort. Um, we have um, well over 25,000 compounds that you would sort of define as a hit, you know, confirmed anti-malarial activity of sort of approximately one micromolar or less. And this, this approach has demonstrably worked. 
it's delivered new drug candidates, some of which are in um, clinical development at the moment, and it's certainly identified a number of new drug targets. So this is all great, but can we actually leverage this a massive amount of research uh, even more? Uh, Nicholas and his team um, have developed, is, came into this, and this is using this 8 million data points, and how can we actually use this in a predictive, a predictive um, way to enable other researchers not to have to screen millions and millions of compounds. Leverage that data, leverage our knowledge. Um, so what was, what was the, uh, the motivation of um, PDPs, um, innovation, have, have, have joined together really with the, the um, ethos of, of trying to develop accessible, uh, affordable and uh, user-friendly computational tools, primarily to support infectious and neglected tropical disease drug discovery. Um, I've given the website there um, where MMV hosts some of these, and Caroline alluded to that earlier. But that's really what the group group did. They, we know that, um, that there are lots and lots of different computational tools that can be used, but many have expensive licenses, many are only for expert users, and, and many are sort of difficult for, for, for researchers to to actually access and how can we actually put these out there where people can use them and use them at no, no cost and this is one example of that and the goal really is to maximize the impact of cost compound testing by enrichment of, of screening sets using the model um, towards a greater proportion of potential actives so you know there's a number of cases and probably those of you out there can think of other ways that the model could be used and i really do encourage that and if you have any great ideas please share it with us you know but we can you know we are we do talk to organizations who have large screening collections who are happy to donate them and how can we maximize the 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 the, the selection of compounds they 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 send to us and share with us um we obviously work with organizations who only have small subsets of their collection and, and get new libraries and want to know whether they should or shouldn't test them with us and also we are aware there are groups with access to novel compounds maybe they're synthetic organic chemistry groups or they may be a, 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 a interested in malaria research but only have limited compound acquisition and want to want to bias their selection of compounds towards those with predictive act activity and Obviously, if this approach works, um, we're, you know, we realize that there are other there are other neglected and tropical diseases in other projects. And so this really is a, is a test case for this kind of um, consensus approach, um, open access are there for the research community and seeing what the uptake of this will be. So, you know, really what we like to say is this is this is fishing for hits, but but doing it in the right place. Uh, rather than rather than fishing in, in the uh, um, so before I finish I'd just like to say that MMV are actually committed to supporting this and please do pass this on I, I do realize that that not everyone will be aware of this tool and not everyone will be um, will have dialed into this WebEx and um, hopefully um, a number I know a number of people tend to access this after the event but for, for, for those of you out there please do contact uh, MMV. We've set up a dedicated sort of email address um, and this is if you'd like to test any sample that you identify using the tool uh, in one of our blood stage assays. So essentially you need to be able to supply the compound, uh, a, a screening sample of the compound, it may even be less than one milligram depending on how you want to supply it. Um, we will check the structure just to make sure that it hasn't been tested before. You know, we obviously don't want to duplicate testing, but then we will test the compound in one of our assays at no cost to the re compound requester, and we'll share the results freely with the person. And the requester owns the data. MMV have no, that's where MMV's involvement is. We don't have, we don't, we don't have any ownership of it. We don't, we don't. expect to do anything to publish or I want to approach MMV to see if this could be a project. So this is just one way that we can actually support that by making sure that uh, if you don't have the assay and you do have interesting compounds, um, they can be tested. And that's where I end. I'd just like to, before um, before handing over to Nicola, so I'd just like to thank the, the project team. So you can see it's a, it's a, it's a large, it's a large uh, team from, from many, many different organisations, all, all, all freely contributing their time and effort towards this model. And you know, from an MMV perspective, 
uh, we were at a Valeria Drug Discovery perspective. We'd really just like to thank everyone. So with that, um, I will hand over to Nicholas. Thank you, James. Um, uh, we'll share my screen now. Okay, and right. Uh, thank you, James, for presenting the project. So um, I'm in charge of uh, now presenting the, the technical aspect of this malaria project. And uh, in particular, uh, it's, uh, its main outcome, which is the malaria inhibitor prediction platform or as we also call it, MAPE. Um, the, the work that I would present during the next uh, 20 minutes, roughly, uh, is a work that uh, I did with uh, my colleagues, Eloy Felix and uh, Andrew Leach. The three of us, we are uh, working at the European uh, Bioinformatics Institute, which is one of the sites of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, EMBL. It's uh, Europe's home for biological data services, research and uh, training, and we are considered as uh, a major uh, data provider for uh, life sciences. Uh, currently, EMBA, uh, EMBI, sorry, EBI, employs uh, around 800 staff, which, uh, as you can imagine, are all working from home at the moment. Uh, when I said that we, we are a data provider. We, we develop databases, tools, software that makes possible to align, verify, and visualize diverse uh, biological data that are produced by uh, the public uh, domain, but uh, not only. And that makes this information freely available to everyone. Just to give you some figures, uh, uh, it's estimated that there are around uh, 68 million requests uh, sent to uh, our services every day. That's uh, in 2018, that was 23 billion for the, for the year. And uh, when I talk about uh, databases and storage, we have uh, 273 petabytes of uh, storage available. Now let's talk about the project and uh, our uh, solution to cope with uh, the, the need of new therapies for uh, malaria, against malaria. So we provide to develop a machine learning consensus approach to predict blood stage malaria inhibition. To do that, we aim to combine large compound collection and we want to do this to increase the predictivity of the resulting mod model and uh, the, the, the chemical space uh, that uh, it can uh, uh, can be applied on. Instead of uh, sharing uh, directly uh, this uh, different training set, we uh, decided to uh, share the model instead. And this is mainly due to confidentiality reason because it's a, a public private con consortium and some partners have reason not wanting to uh, share publicly their collection of compounds. There was, uh, as Jem said, that the project started uh, five years ago. There was already uh, a paper uh, in 2017 where the, the authors described uh, a consensus approach and they demonstrated the added value of combining uh, the, the models to better predict anti malaria uh, compound. But uh, due to um, several reasons, and uh, in particular, the, the, the use of proprietary source of software, such as Pipeline Pilot, uh, it was not possible uh, at this stage to make the, the resulting model available uh, for the public domain. Therefore, when we joined this consortium uh, three, two or three years ago for uh, this successor project, uh, we were asked to, uh, to use only open source tools and with the constraint to, uh, to, to build models that are comparable uh, as close as possible to what Paplan Pilot is able to do. It means that we have to, to use the same machine learning technique, similar molecular descriptor, similar descriptor selection. There was very little room for, uh, for uh, investigating uh, any, any new thing. Um, the project was also uh, divided in, in three phases. In the first one, we, we had to uh, 
identify this open source soft software that uh, could be uh, used for the project. And uh, we had to demonstrate that we were able to reproduce uh, uh, a pipeline pilot model. The second phase, um, our partners uh, trained uh, models on their training sets. They sent us back the resulting model. We evaluated them and we um, implemented consensus approaches. Finally, in the last phase, using the best consensus approach, we developed a, a prediction platform that is uh, al already available publicly for everyone. Um, as I said, we, uh, our partners provided a tra uh, training sets and validation sets in order to build and to validate uh, our models. We had uh, a total of 11 training sets, all of malleable stage uh, inhibition that uh, represent uh, approximately 6 million compounds tested. Uh, we expect a large di di diversity uh, um, from a, a chemical space point of view, and therefore we expect the resulting model to be, uh, uh, to, to be applied on, on a very wide chemical space. We had three validation sets in order to uh, assert the, the predictivity of the model. And uh, I, I will use uh, this validation set to show you uh, our results. But before I go any further, may, maybe I need to stop for two minutes to um, uh, explain what I mean uh, about model, because depending on, on where you, uh, on your field, a model can be many different things. So here I'm referring to a compound-based model that is using machine learning to predict uh, properties for new compounds. Uh, if I, to, to illustrate this, um, let's say we have a, a small collection of compounds as is represented here. And, and we can describe this compound, for instance, using structure-derived descriptors, such as this uh, fingerprint, where each, each case, depending on if it's one or zero, represents the uh, presence or the absence of a substructure in the molecule. But you can also use property uh, descriptors, such as uh, physical chemical pro property descriptors, such as lipophilicity or molecular weight. You can do this for all your collection of compounds. And of course, each compound is associated to a dependent va variable. And um, this, uh, this, uh, this variable in our case is uh, if the compound is active or inactive in a uh, blood stage uh, anti-malaria -mal assay. Now that we have numerical uh, values for our compound, we can use this as an input for uh, a machine learning algorithm, which uh, uh, is uh, represented by this uh, black cube. It can be uh, any machine learning algorithm, like na naive Bayes, multilinear regression, and so on. Once the, uh, this uh, um, this uh, this model has been has been trained, it can be used to predict this uh, variable uh, on new molecules. And it can help answering uh, questions such as uh, which compound uh, I should buy or, or test. To, to, uh, and also may, maybe which compound I should buy to or I should synthesize. Okay, so now that uh, we have the definition of a, a model, this is uh, a summary of our protocol to build uh, the, the model. So we, we developed a script that uh, we sent to uh, the different partners. And they uh, they run the, they run it on their uh, on their collection of compounds uh, in a secure way behind their firewall, and the script was in charge of uh, standardizing the the molecule using a molecule standardizer which is uh, uh, available freely. It described the molecule using one of uh, this uh, structure-based uh, descriptors, which is uh, very similar to uh, FTFP6, if you know Pipeline Pilot, but now it's provided by Articate, which is open source. And uh, we had to use uh, a naive based algorithm, but uh, in, the, in, in Scikit-learn, which is the open source li library uh, available in Python that we use to train the model, uh, there, there was no uh, match of, uh, of the, um, the naive base which is uh, implemented in, 
Python pilot. Therefore, we had to implement uh, a Laplace corrected knife base. This is my uh, colleague uh, Eloy who, who did that. He fully integrated this uh, modified knife base uh, in, in scikit-learn. So it can be used as any scikit-learn model. Uh, you, it can be used with full or sparse mat matrices, work with uh, either uh, hashed or unhashed uh, fingerprint. Also, uh, it used any function which is uh, implemented in scikit-learn, uh, such as cross-validation, cross -validation, and you can also use all the different performance metrics that are implemented. Very importantly, uh, the, it gives uh, a model which is as performant as the existing scikit-learn naive base model. Um, this uh, modified naive base is also fully available on GitHub. Our partners, therefore, using uh, the, uh, our tools uh, implemented in a script, they trained uh, a binary classification on their uh, training set. They sent us back the, the models, we evaluated them, we consider that all the models were per performant enough to be used in uh, a consensus approach. So we started uh, to develop consensus approaches. The first one, we call it the, the max score, where for each predicted compound, we take the maximum score returned by the models. So in this example, if you have a compound one predicted by four mod models, you look at which is the, uh, we identify which is the, the lowest, the, the highest score, and you keep this for the consensus. You do this for all the compounds in, uh, in your set. We also implemented a min rank consensus, where in that case for the compound, we take the minimum rank returned by the models, now, uh, instead of using the score directly, we use the ranks and, uh, and we take the, the minimum rank given by a model. So in that case, now the minimum rank for compound one is given by an NV1. <clears throat> in the mean score consensus, we uh, calculate the uh, average model score. So we, it, it results in uh, having only uh, one uh, score. We, we, we don't know which model is providing this, this score, it's just uh, an average. And uh, at last, we implemented uh, what we call the meta model, which is uh, a, mo a naive base model that combined together all the single mod models that our partners provided. And to do this, we uh, combined the features and the uh, associated weight in a, in, in a big, uh, naive base model, which is what uh, I will present here uh, on this illustration. You you have uh, well a lot uh, a lot of uh, naive base uh, mo model. You combine them, you get a, a big one, and you can use it as any uh, any naive base classifier. You can just predict uh, a compound, and you get a single score for your compound. We uh, evaluated the performance of this uh, consensus uh, approaches. To do this, we, we used our three validation sets that were available. And you can see the, the result on these three uh, histograms. First of all, you can see that uh, the, 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 the consensus approaches all uh, show more or less the same level of performance. There is uh, no uh, consensus approach that really outperform uh, all the time uh, the, the, the other three. The second result interesting here, I, I put here the, what's, uh, the, what I call the median mod model. It's by taking the 11 uh, individual uh, models and uh, measuring their performance individually and then uh, calculating the, the median uh, um, on this 11 models. And, and it gives a median score. Which is uh, yeah, which is just what you can what you you can expect if you take individually the the eleven model models and you try to to see how they perform. And and what we see here once again is that uh, it it does not perform better than the consensus approach, which is uh, an important result. But uh, uh, on the opposite, uh, the the consensus approach most of the time performs slightly better than this median uh, individual model. And it, it's very important because, uh, I mean, you, it, it's, a, it's a median, the, the score that I represent here. But, so it means that uh, some models among the, the, 
this S11 model might perform better, I mean, perform better than the, the consensus approach. Sure. But um, you, you have no way to know in advance uh, if, if it's going to, to be true. Uh, our observation with this revelation set showed that uh, it's not always the same uh, single model that uh, perform better than uh, the consensus approach that use all the, the 11 mod models. Um, therefore, um, it, it makes the, the, uh, the consensus approach, any of them, uh, very valuable uh, in, in order to uh, increase the, the performance uh, in our predictions. With um, this in mind, we developed uh, MAPE for uh, Malaria Inhibitor Prediction. It's a web platform which is already available. You, you have the, the URL uh, at the bottom of the slide. And for MAPE, we used uh, only one consensus approach. We had to choose one and we, uh, we used the, the meta model for two reasons. Uh, first of all, as I said, all, all the different uh, consensus approaches perform more or less the same. The second reason is uh, pragmatic. With the other three consensus approach, you have to predict uh, 11 times uh, each compound in your set. If you, have a, a, if you submit a file of 1 million compound, it's 1 million, uh, sorry, it's uh, 11 million uh, prediction that you, you need to run. If with the, the meta model, you only run uh, one prediction. Uh, for uh, one compound. Uh, now I will go through uh, a demo of, uh, of MAPE. I recorded a video that I will uh, comment that's to avoid any technical issue. So this is MAPE um, and uh, it is accessible through this URL as I already said. Uh, it's a very simple interface. It has three tabs. The, the home page where you can run the prediction, terms and condition, instruction that gives you access to uh, technical documentation. I will uh, run a prediction right now uh, and I will uh, keep this, uh, talking at, uh, in the meantime. I do this because uh, when you, you click on run, it submits a job to run, that will uh, execute the prediction. And this job uh, has entered a, a, a queuing system. And depending on how uh, this, uh, this queue is used, it, it might take several minutes to uh, return the uh, prediction. Very importantly is the input file that you submit. Uh, you can click on this uh, link that I try to show now and, and um, it will give you the detail of this input file. Here is just a paragraph that stress uh, what James has said and uh, the, the, the role that uh, MNV uh, can have uh, for your result. I will close the, the, the tab that contains the prediction because it's not necessary to keep it open. Uh, there is a system that uh, keeps your job in, in, in memory and when, when you come back, uh, you, you, you will have your, your result. So this is the documentation. Uh, there is an introduction. There is a section that uh, discuss the, the molecule standardization. It's open source, as I already said. Uh, a section that explain the input file for format, only two columns, smiles and the identifier of the, the compound, the output file. Okay. And, and now uh, a section that uh, try to explain how to use the, the result of MAPE. So uh, we put here how, how the score is, is calculated, how we validated the model, our three validation set, the result on our three validation set, summary of this result, and at the end, uh, a conclusion that uh, explains how we expect you to uh, use this uh, result. Now I will come back uh, to the prediction platform to MAPE and the results should appear in one second. Here it is. So uh, we put here again the, the, the result on our validation set to, to insist on, on this. Uh, on the right panel, we have the result of uh, the prediction that I've just run with an histogram that show the, uh, the scores. There is a message that say that 144 compound cannot be parsed uh, by the standardizer due to issues with the structure. We can download the, the file, it's a spreadsheet. Uh, you can see that there are four columns. The, ident the ID of the, of the, the compound as uh, submitted by the user, the corresponding smile the standardized smile, which is uh, given by our molecule standardizer, and the, the model score. Right. 
So a few more words on how we uh, expect uh, the user to, to use MAP and uh, the, the result that MAP provides. So um, MAP does not return uh, a flag that say that the, the compound is potentially the, the, the a new antimalarial drug. It returns a score that uh, if, if you want to know what it means, it's better to compare it with the, the result that we obtain with our three vali validation set. And uh, what did, did we see on our three validation set? As you can see on this histograms where I represented in orange the, the, distribution, the score distribution for the active and in blue for the inactive, that we have uh, an, an overlap between the active and the inactive uh, that's uh, expected. Uh, a, a model is never perfect. Um, but this overlap is, uh, is uh, more or, or less uh, important depending on, on the, the data set. But if you want to get a good en enrichment, uh, by enrichment, I, I mean you, you select, you, you, you rank your, your prediction and you select one, 10 or, or 50%, you expect to have a, a higher number of, of uh, active in, in this uh, subset of your data set. If you want uh, um, a high enrichment, we, uh, we suggest to use only score that are above 40 or 50. Further guidance on the potential use cases, we, we expect MAPE to be used as a virtual screening tool. And as any virtual screening tool, um, there, there, there is further analysis that you need to do uh, once you get the results. And you, you might need to filter out some compound based on the physical chemical properties or based on uh, some functional group that you don't want uh, to have in your in your eats, such as uh, pains or uh, reactive uh, compound. Uh, also, uh, to identify new uh, potential new drugs, uh, you, you need to avoid uh, st structural class that are already uh, known uh, to, to work in antimalarial compounds. Regarding uh, heat optimization, well, we, we will recommend not to um, submit uh, an existing series to, to MAPE because uh, if all your compounds uh, are, are already uh, active, you, you won't uh, get uh, further information from the MAPE. To conclude, um, I have shown you that uh, in this uh, project, 11 naive based models were trained by different partners in order to predict malaria inhibition at a blood stage level. The consensus implementation uh, that we, we developed uh, show overall performance improvement. And um, most of all, uh, this consensus approaches, they uh, result in a very big model that uh, contains the information of 6 million compounds. Uh, using the meta model, we developed MAPE, which is uh, publicly available right now. The, the model has already applied in partnership with uh, MMV, and uh, we have just obtained uh, some uh, good results that we will present shortly. Regarding um, our work at uh, the EBI, we are preparing uh, a paper uh, that will um, describe uh, some technical aspect that I didn't have time to present here. Now I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, if, you, if you have some compound, please try MAPE. You, you have the, the address. As, as I said several times, it's already accessible. It's free. If you have questions or feedback, please uh, drop us an email. And with that, uh, thank you again. Thank you, Nicola. Mark, did you want to say something? Yes, thanks very much indeed, Nicholas and uh, and James earlier. Um, Nicola just mentioned the uh, some results we had recently, so uh, just wanted to elaborate on that a little bit. So James um, kindly found some funding uh, before Christmas to buy some compounds uh, on the basis of this model. So uh, what we did was um, uh, use the model 
uh, to prioritize the selection of, uh, well, we, we purchased 6,000 compounds um, of which 80% were predicted um, by the model and 20% were a random test set to compare with the, uh, the predicted actives. And uh, yesterday, as it happens, uh, we got the first round of HTS data, um, which was that we saw uh, six or seven times higher hit rate in the predicted actives than in the um, random set. So the enrichment in activity was, was six to seven fold. So I think it was about a 3% hit rate in the predicted actives and about 0.4% in the random set. Obviously, they're only um, primary uh, HTS data and the, the dose response is still to be done, but at least it's an encouraging start. I should say that um, as Nicholas was going through the idea that you'd want to um, check for uh, structural attractiveness and removing um, well-worked anti-malarial series and make sure that the physchem properties are in the range that you want. All of those things were done um, and uh, in, in that. So these are not just um, lots of known uh, analogs of, of known anti-malarials. Um, so that's an encouraging start in terms of prospective validation. Um, so hopefully there'll be more about that uh, in the not too distant future. Okay. Oh, so uh, um, I'm sure that James and Nicola, or sure that everybody would be happy to answer questions. Uh, as we've got quite a small audience, if you want to unmute yourself, um, you can ask a question. Guys, would you like to turn your videos on so that people can see you? Lovely, thanks. So, so whilst, whilst we're waiting, that I, I had a question about um, known anti-malarials. So how, how is your uh, novice user who's not, not used to working in this field going to know what the work, well-worked examples are? Is there anywhere that you can go, go to to find a list of those? Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of publicly available lists, um, I, there, there, you know, there, there are, you know, you can, you can look at sort of resources like Drug Bank and, and things like that to look for anti-malarial. And Campbell, James. Campbell. <laughs> Obviously, it's in Campbell, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so there, there are, there are lists out there. I mean, we have developed, you know, um, some uh, malaria fragment tools. We did one in, in, in partnership with Optibrium um, for those users of Sardrop that is actually on their website that, that, that flags compounds that contain fragments of known anti-malarials. For people who don't have that access to that tool, you know, I'm happy to share the list of fragments that we that we developed. That's just really more a sort of chemist's eye fragmentation. So there, so there are there are lists available for those people who don't who haven't uh, seen those sorts of structures. And obviously, um, if you if you um, you know, depending, you know, if you were to screen compounds, you know, and you share the structure and you wanted to test them with MMV, we will we'll happily have a look at them and, and say, well, actually, you know, we've worked that or that, you know, that's been that's been done before. So, you know, so it's it's uh, there are all sorts of ways that you can find out. <laughs> Thanks, James. Can I just ask a quick question um, following up on, um, on what Mark was saying about those results, which sound really interesting. So the the predicted set that you had of molecules um, from the model that you, you mentioned that you took out things like there were analogs of known structures that were known to be antimalarial. Do you, do you have a sense that the structural diversity in that, in that predicted set was about the same as in the test set? Well, they were certainly selected to be diverse. That was another yeah. criterion. So we didn't just pick the top N um, predicted actives. Uh, so there was, um, you know, a large commercial set, they were all scored. And then uh, we took, I don't know, the top few percent, I'd have to remember, I think it was about top, about 150,000. So it was a large chunk to start with, and then um, took out analogs of known antimalarials, took out structurally unattractive things, 
and then did some uh, clustering to make sure that we did have a diverse set of compounds in there. I haven't yet gone in to look at the actual results with a view to, I think there were a hundred and about 150 actives, depends on how you define the cutoff. Um, so it was six fold if you defined it at 70% inhibition, I think it was seven fold if you defined it at 40% inhibition, which was about three standard deviations from the mean. Um, so I haven't, I haven't gone to look at the structures yet. I guess, you know, typical um, uh, med chem skepticism would probably want to see some dose response activity before getting too excited by the structures. But I, I think they, they, they would be, uh, you know, fairly diverse from the way that the work was done. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing result, I think. I mean, it's it's, a, it's an excellent point, Matt. I mean, it is it is very true that if you just if you just took a you know you, you know you went to a commercial compound provider, you know, an e molecules or someone like that, fire that into the model, it will do what it what it's meant to do, and you will get you know chloroquine at the top of the list of but you know it, it will do that. So you do have to actually do that second step. Now we're not necessarily expecting everyone who's, who submits ideas or wants to use it to actually necessarily do that. And even in terms of drug, you know, drug likeness, you know, I, you know, we were thinking, oh, do we have to include some paragraph like that? Or oh, it must be a drug like that, however you want to define that molecule. And I don't think we even really want people to have to constrain themselves necessarily in that way. You know, we recommend that you take out sort of overtly reactive groups but we all know what you know you know you know any of us who work in malaria drug discovery space know that you know the difference between a uh, you know the log p of an atovaquone and the log p of a proguanol the reactivity of an artesanate versus the oh, sorry james we're, lo we're losing your sound you know, there's, there's a whole range of compounds that have activity. So I think, uh, oh, sorry. Well, oh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think you're trying to say that you're, try you're very happy to engage again? with people that want to um, screen compounds and uh, work, work with them on exactly. which ones you think. Yeah. It's sorry, exactly. yeah, we did lose you for a bit there. Sorry, everyone. It's, 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 it's a public holiday in Geneva, so perhaps everyone's like at home watching Netflix or something. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Anyone else like to ask a question? Uh, There's a question from David Hong, just noticed on the chat. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I can answer that. Uh, thanks, David, for your question. So David is asking what's the definition of active in the model. So it, it depends on the training set. We, we had uh, 11 uh, training sets that were obtained from uh, different assays. Uh, and, um, and therefore, the, 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 um, the, the owners of uh, the training set used uh, their, the, the definition that they, they, they wanted. So we had um, di different threshold. Everything will be uh, uh, available in uh, in the article that uh, we will submit soon, and it will be uh, uh, open access, so we have this information. Do you think that was a problem that people uh, def made their own definition of active? I I think it's, well, I'll jump in here, Karen. I, I think That's it's really a pragmatic way. Um, these. <laughs> The, the people, the collaborators who were running their own assays know their assays the best. And so um, I think it's appropriate for them to um, provide the appropriate definitions. I don't think, Nicholas, you may be able to comment. I mean, there were no obvious sort of extremes. You know, it wasn't as though any of the 11 training sets were wildly, you know, um, sort of different to any others. Um, but clearly they all had different types of compounds, different numbers of compounds. I think it's just, an, it's just a, a restraint on this type of project, which is an interesting aspect of it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and just to, to, to add up, uh, they, they are, um, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert in this field, but they are, there is a, a limited num number of assays that, that you can use, uh, limited uh, strains or so of uh, uh, um, plasmodium falciparum. Uh, and, um, and so the, the 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 difference mainly will will be which strain has been has been used, 
uh, if uh, the active and inactives were determined on a, a primary screen or on, on, on a single dose or on, on a multi dose uh, 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 screening. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So uh, we have a question from Andy who says, How would you expect the model to behave on series with novel mechanisms? Question. Well, I can, I, can, I can take a stab at, at, at that one. So an apologies in advance if my connection breaks up again. Um, so in a sense, the model, the model is dependent on what's been fed into the model. And that's the, the 6 million compounds that, that have been screened by the various parts. Yeah, I'd like to say there are a lot of compounds there that will not add a, a mechanism of action assigned to them. They will have not been pursued by the partners. They've not been able to, you know, develop uh, drug resistant mutants that they then use reverse genetics to identify the mechanism of action or other, you know, whatever the techniques are. So I'd like to think that there are data points associated with novelty. If you are coming from the glass half empty and it really is a genuinely novel mechanism of action and the, chem the chemical uh, motif that inhibits via, you know, works via inhibition or whatever is modulation of that mechanism of action is completely unique, then the model will, by definition, fall down. So, so I think, I'm, I'm glass half full, so I think, I think it will handle most of them. <laughs> I can have a stab at it as well. I, I, I guess I, I think that's, I agree, basically. Um, I, I suppose what I was going to say is that of the 6 million compounds that were tested and of the actives that are in there, I guess the truth is because they will have been tested in a phenotypic assay, we don't know the mechanism of a large proportion of them. Um, so as James said, it will depend a lot on whether chemotypes, related chemotypes have been found active in the training set or were present in the training set. I suppose therefore that it depends a little bit whether what's behind your question is um, will it predict these to be active or not? Um, so I think it will depend what's in the training set, obviously, and whether they were active or not. It, it's not wholly reliant on very similar things to be in the training set, but obviously something with some level of similarity needs to be in the training set. But if what's behind the question is, if I'm working on a series with a novel mechanism of action and I've got a biochemical assay and I'm following my SAR that way, um, would I expect this model to help me in that circumstance? I think it's, I think it's worth trying, but I wouldn't, I would certainly, first of all, ask the question, does it look to me as though this model is helping predict activity? And I think the answer is probably unlikely. Um, so I think it depends a little bit what's behind the question. Okay. Thanks, Mark. So I hope you know, to just, since we worked on a series with MMV, so the data is in the MMV database, but I, I probably not shared widely. So some very potent compounds. I wonder what your how much information is in the literature linking mechanism structure that you would miss because it wasn't represented in your um, in your test set. That's a very good point. We didn't we didn't add all of MMV's data, I think it's true to say, James, this was the, the, the data that went in were HTSs against or, or, you know, screens with large numbers of compounds that were phenotypic assays, not um, particular projects. Uh, yeah, well, it was against, in the data that MMV were free to share. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I guess you'd probably be best to try the, the model and see, but it was certainly wasn't trained on data like that or indeed generically on Kemble, because I suppose at the time we, although that's something we could have done, we wanted really to build on what was unique to MMV and, in, and also in particular to build on the idea of being able to access information from the, the screens like AZ, uh, Novartis, GSK, where obviously we can't see the actual training set compounds, but we can uh, develop a model from that data. Yeah. I guess I was thinking that in, in future, MMV could say, can we use your anonymized data to help improve our model? We don't, we're not yeah. going to publish your structures, yeah. but you know, we, mm. can, we can use the fingerprints from, your from the structures that are active in our, 
in screens that we've paid for to improve the models that would help everybody else. It's a very good point, and the models are set up to essentially uh, to be fairly readily extendable in that way, particularly the way that the guys have, have um, finished up with this meta model. I think it's, I think I'm right in saying that it's, you know, relatively straightforward, at least in principle, to add in uh, data and models from other, um, other, of other types. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody. Maybe a couple of comments here from Matt who says, Matt Todd who says, Maybe a cluster of experimental actives that are predicted to be inactive might suggest a new mechanism of action. And then Andrew, who says this could be an interesting scenario to investigate. I think this is. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. You know, I, I, I agree. It, it certainly could be, yeah. Uh, David Hong has another question. He says, by design, what is primary application of this new in silico tool? Select compounds for future HTS, HTS, look for new chemotypes or guide optimization in discovery programs. From my perspective, uh, and as Nicholas, the, fir the first two. So really it would be looking at, looking at making selections for new HTS. Um, obviously we have, you know, there are constraints on, on the compounds, the number of compounds we can access, whether it's through partners and the number of compounds we can screen through budget for screening. So, uh, um, there will always be a place for, in, for enriching those selections. There, there will also be a place for doing stuff that we've never done before. And that's the other way that we can actually use these models is to actually um, uh, enrich for chemical space that we haven't actually explored. I mean, it's not built into this model that you, you have, but that you, you can use on, on, the, on the EBI website, but we can also do that. Uh, in terms of, as Nicholas said, in terms of actually using it in, in lead optimization, um, you know, it's, it's not quite got that level of granularity within the model. I mean, if you, you know, if you have a hundred compounds and, and, you know, it won't, it won't, I don't think, believe it will be looking at it and saying, oh, well, I can tell you that if you move the methyl around the ring or you have a fluorine rather than a, rather than a chlorine, you're going to have to have that level of, that level of knowledge around it, uh, is, is my understanding of how, how the model would work. But it's really more for like enriching um, uh, screening sets, primarily. So, of course, we don't want to swamp your server, but uh, are there any plans to run some of the things like Enamine you know, Real Space through models like this? Uh, MAPE uh, will work uh, as long as uh, your file that you submit uh, contains uh, less than 1 million compounds. So, uh, I, 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 I mean, it's uh, fair to say that it's not going to work if you submit the zinc or, or Enamine, no. But, um, uh, you can contact us if you are uh, interested, and you can, you, you can we can see because uh, we can run the model in internally, and we don't have this uh, limitation. And that's something that we have discussed in in the past. Maybe we should uh, we should predict uh, all the commercial li libraries and uh, make available the predictions, so pe pe people are, are not uh, you know uh, I'm not going to try. Everyone is going to to try to to predict uh, zinc and uh, well. Yeah. It's not going to work. So, uh, yeah, no, that, that's something uh, we can discuss.